Given what most Americans believe, the next statement may be more shocking than any previous. The fact is, the United States is not a country, but a corporation contractually created by the Constitution. Your state is a country, per the law, and your original citizenship is of that country. Our founders instituted themselves to be first and foremost citizens of their respective states. As of 1787, those states already had formed a union, and they created the Constitution for the purpose of perfecting that union in forming a national government. They did not intend that the new nation have any jurisdiction or powers over the states or their citizens that were not specifically enumerated in the Constitution. They stated this point quite clearly in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the Constitution. They granted the United States exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district not exceeding 10 miles square as may become the seat of the government of the United States, our District of Columbia, and to exercise authority over all places purchased by the consent of the states. And that is all. The framers further secured the rights of the people with the Ninth and Tenth Amendments in the Bill of Rights. In the Ninth, they established that the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. And in the tenth, they made clear that the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. The only way the federal government can have any jurisdiction beyond these constitutional clauses is by written permission or contract. Which leads us to another piece of the puzzle, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, ratified in 1868 following the Civil War. As barbaric as it may sound today, the black slaves, prior to the conclusion of the Civil War, were legally considered to be property, with none of the rights or privileges of free-born people, only duties. The money interests took advantage of America's desire to free the slaves, and found a way to use the swiftly adopted post-war constitutional amendments to enslave all of the people. The deceit is in the wording of both the 13th and 14th Amendments. You will note that the 13th Amendment provides that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist within the United States. But why the emphasis on involuntary servitude? Isn't it the same thing as slavery? Sure it is but they had to mention the concept of involuntary servitude because they wished to retain another type of slavery, voluntary servitude. Voluntary servitude is an ancient and established concept. It was the way serfs became subjects to their lords during feudal times in England and other European countries. It was a way for free men to earn a living at a time when all property was held by a select few, and thus anyone who wanted to farm and support their family had first to agree to be subject to a lord of the land. Our forefathers hated this concept and designed our Constitution to exclude titles of nobility, making all Americans sovereign. The 14th Amendment turned the intention of the founders on its ear by making voluntary servitude a requirement for former slaves to gain the rights already guaranteed to free-born United States citizens. When the slaves were released from their involuntary servitude following the war, their status was changed from that of being property to that of being a person. But being a person still entitled them to none of the rights associated with citizenship. So the 14th Amendment ostensibly was written to provide the former slaves with the same constitutional rights of freeborn American citizens, but only if they agreed first to become subject to the jurisdiction of the corporate United States, making oneself paramountly, that is, first subject to the jurisdiction of the laws of the United States, however, limits access to parts of the Bill of Rights, as we'll explain in a moment. But first remember, anyone who voluntarily subjects himself to the laws or jurisdiction of another is, in every way, obligated to abide by the terms of any contracts or laws established by whomever establishes the rules of the contract. In simple terms, 
This meant that the former slaves became subjects first to the United States and secondly to the state in which they lived. They had no sovereignty whatsoever. This status had never existed in the United States prior to that time. The 14th Amendment created a new class of citizenship in the United States, a second class citizenship. Up until 1868, every American was a paramount citizen of their state and by virtue of that also a citizen of the United States with full individual sovereignty as guaranteed by amendments 9 and 10 in the Bill of Rights. But so-called naturalized citizens or 14th Amendment citizens are paramountly subject to all laws of the United States and having no status as freeborn citizens have no access at all to the unenumerated rights retained for the people by Articles 9 and 10 of the Bill of Rights. That's because, in order to get any rights at all, they had to subject themselves to the jurisdiction of the corporate United States, which left them no unenumerated rights. The only rights they had were those specifically written into the Constitution. The sad tragedy of America today is that all U.S. citizens, regardless of race, are now 14th Amendment slaves due to contracts with the government of the United States through Social Security, birth certificates, driving licenses, citizenship statements, tax forms, and many other documents. The true paramount citizenship that all Americans deserve is that of their respective state, which is a sovereign citizenship. Such status would exempt them from federal and state income taxes, as well as property and inheritance taxes. This sovereign citizenship was the status held by our forefathers. Now, if you're still thinking that the U.S. government needs to have a central bank and collect income tax or it will collapse, think again. Over two-thirds of the federal government's income is derived from sources other than income tax. There is even evidence suggesting that none of your income tax is used by the government. Fees, excise taxes, tariffs, sales taxes, and other forms of income have easily supported the U.S. budget in the past and could easily support it now. We have done without a national bank for large stretches of our history, and the U.S. Treasury is perfectly capable of printing and managing a money supply. In fact, the only constitutionally sanctioned currency is backed by gold or other precious metals. This is a far more stable form of currency and is the type of money the Treasury was designed to handle. The government was doing so well collecting money under these original laws that it had amassed a huge surplus by the time this cartoon was penned a hundred years later in 1887, when there still was no income tax collected at all. Up to this point, we have shown you how the money interests have, one, established the Federal Reserve System, and two, exploited a second class of citizenship created by the 14th Amendment for other purposes. And we have mentioned a few names involved in the creation of the Fed. But there are other organizations working for our economic enslavement as well, along with other extremely rich and powerful international bankers. Those who support the Fed have created a global movement to centralize economic power in various puppet organizations that preach peace and stability through some variation of socialism, but act aggressively to draw nations into a web of foreign debt and servitude to their agenda. The United Nations, the World Monetary Fund, and the Council on Foreign Relations are all committed to an agenda of world domination through manipulation of economic power. The Council on Foreign Relations openly admits to being a private club, yet it is the primary recruiting post in both international banking and the federal government of the United States. Richard Nixon, Nelson Rockefeller, John Foster Dulles, Dean Rusk, Alger Hiss, Robert S. McNamara, and every president since FDR, with the exception of John Kennedy, have been members of this exclusive club where super financiers and your elected representatives can mix freely and plan the next step in the consolidation of power in a new world order.